Nothing will challenge your faith like the suffering of an innocent person. I'm telling you. You see some child or some young adult suffering and it will challenge your faith. And I love what Maggie said. This is what, this is what suffering does. She said, suffering strips away. That's what it does. If you've ever been through suffering, it takes from you. It takes your health. It takes your opportunities. It takes your future. I've talked to people before and you know what they experience when they suffer? Dream death. Have you ever had dream death? That's when all of the things that you thought you were gonna do or you were gonna do in your marriage or you're gonna do with your family are no longer happening. And I love what Maggie said. She basically says, I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna embrace the mystery. God is working, but I don't know how. And at the end of that story, we got to see a little bit of how God's working. Let me just say this, by the way. If you are suffering in any way, this is why we have a prayer team. At the end of the service, if you're going through something, just while we're singing that last worship song, I want you to come on up and I want you to get prayed over. Because one of the things we're gonna do as a church is we are going to walk together through suffering, okay? This is, this is why we gather together. And by, and by the way, speaking of gathering together, we had something incredible happen on Friday night here. I wanna show you a picture. We had 1,000, or actually over 1,000 men for our men's night. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Guys, it, look, again, I'm not guilting you. I'm not making you feel bad. If you were not here, you missed out, totally. We can't put lightning in a bottle. It doesn't transfer on YouTube. You had to be here. It was, in, uh, John, I picked John up from the airport. The guys heard this story because I told him it when they were there that night. I picked John up from the airport and he says, you know, mate, he has all this language for me, this Australian, he's Australian. He says, hey mate, he said, uh, how many men do you think are coming tonight? I said, well, we have 900 registered. He said, that's the largest group of men that I will speak to this entire tour. So here's, what, why am I telling you that? God's up to something unique. Especially getting, it was, I can't get into, it wouldn't be appropriate to get into the details of what he talked about, but it was just an incredible time. Um, and let me tell you this, for those of you who are interested, John Tyson is a giant. And I recorded a separate podcast with him that we're gonna be releasing this week. He talks about how he came to faith in Christ, um, how he got called to ministry, how he ends up in New York City from Australia, what life is like in New York City, what it was like to be personally mentored by the late, great Tim Keller. So you don't want to miss that. By the way, ladies, coming up in two weeks is your turn, Jen Wilkin. Are you ladies excited? The Oprah Winfrey of evangelicalism will be in the building. Guys, we have, so you, you ladies, I mean, men don't register for things, but women do, okay? And we have almost 1,300 women registered. So we have 1,300 seats. So uh, don't tell anyone else about this event. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Guys, we're, well, listen, we're gonna make, you're gonna be sitting on the floor. We're gonna, we're, we'll seat the mezzanine. We're gonna make it happen. You're gonna, you're gonna wanna be here for that event. Finally, guys, it's Mother's Day. If you're just finding out it's Mother's Day, you are in so much trouble. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, um, guys, we love moms. Listen, I love, I love my mom. I love the wife uh, and mom of my, my wife and the mom of our, our kids. Um, in Mother's Day, I say this every year, but Mother's Day is both a time of great celebration and it's a time for some people, it's a really, really hard day. If you're here and you're a mom, stand up. Just stand up if you're a mom. Don't be, get, get up. Come on. Look at this. All around this. Hey, if Christ, hey, listen, if Christ is the head of the church, moms are the heart. Sit down. Ladies, thank you so much. And listen, I, you know, John Tyson just did something to me this week. I mean, he's just... He's just a man full of faith. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, I thought, you know, this is a, Mother's Day is also a very hard day for people. It's a hard day because you lost your mom, or it's a hard day because you're still single, and you're like, if I, I want to be a mom, but I'm not even married, and it's a hard, you know, one of, the, one of the silent suffering in churches is infertility, and we can't get pregnant, we can't stay pregnant. You know what, i just coming off of a time with John Tyson, I just wanna pray for anyone in this room right now who would say, you know what, I, I, we've been trying to get pregnant and we can't, we can't get pregnant, we can't stay pregnant. Listen, I'm not gonna force anyone to. But if you're in here right now, I'd like to pray with you. But I'd like the people around you to pray with you for a second. If you're here right now and you're struggling with infertility and you would have the courage to stand, would you stand? We wanna pray with you on this Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you. If you're around them, put your hands on them. Yes, up there, I see that. Over there, yep. 
Guys, we're just gonna pray. If you'll extend hands, we're gonna pray. Listen, we need to believe God for big things. And we're gonna just pray. Well, I'm gonna pray for us. Lord, I thank you for the few couples in here. I know there's probably some others who said, I, we don't wanna stand about this. But this is, there's not a lot, you know, there's some things we struggle with and we go, okay, I don't have a verse for this. But then we, we look at the desire for a mom to have kids and we realize this is a big theme in the Old Testament. This is the beginning of the New Testament where God, there are women who are crying out who wanna have kids. And I pray for these women and their husbands that stand next to them. Lord, I pray that you would give them the desire of their hearts. Well, I mean, it's a prayer for life. It's a prayer, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of desires that you would wanna answer. Would you give us a, children, a child or many children that we might raise them in the Lord? that we might teach them the gospel, that we might pass on the faith, Lord. So I pray that even right now, Lord, you would do something in them. I pray that we would be celebrating that they are, as the Bible says, that they are with child, Lord. We believe in the power of prayer. We claim all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Um, well, look, there's a busy, we're in the summer now, right? It's summertime. Uh, and, uh, there's a huge event happening in this summer that I wanna make sure you guys know about. My birthday is at the end of this summer, okay? <laughs> this is not a normal birthday. I'm turning 40 this summer, okay? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what, what happens when you're 40 is nothing, you know, the word young drops off the front of your, you know, I'm just, I'm no longer a young man, I'm just a man, right? And as soon as you turn 40, nothing you do is impressive anymore, right? You make a lot of money before 40, people are like, yeah. You make a lot of money after 40, like, you should, you should be. You're, you're like 48, what do you, I mean, yeah, you know. Um, and pray for my dear wife. I mean, I, I, normal birthdays are, I'm like, hey, you're in and you're out. My birthday's not a big deal. But 30 was a national holiday, okay. And 40, I'm pretty sure, is going to be an international holiday. She says, you have such high expectations that I don't know what to do. I'm like, I know, I don't know. In preparation, I'm reading a lot of books. I'm reading a lot of books. Well, this is because kind of, you guys binge Netflix shows. I binge books. I mean, I, I'm, I'm binging on second life, like second half of life books, you know. Interesting, Freud, that great psychoanalyst, he focused on the first half of your life and he was obsessed with your relationship with your mother. That's what he wrote on. Carl Jung was obsessed with the second half of life. Like, how do you deal with legacy and generations. And, well, one of the things I've been reading a lot about is health span versus lifespan. Pretty simple, right? Your lifespan is how long you live. Now, this is what's interesting. In 1900, that wasn't that long ago in history, you know, speaking of historical matters. In 1900, the average lifespan, you're not gonna believe this, was 44 years old. Fact. So midlife was 22. Today, the average lifespan is 75 years old. But they did, I don't know how they figured this out. I'm just passing it along. They did lifespan versus health span. So lifespan, average age in America, 75. Average health span, 65. What does that mean? The average person will suffer some type of chronic illness, some type of disability for about a decade of their life. Now, some people say, I'm not, no, that's not gonna be me, like this guy. Let me show you a picture. You ever heard of Brian Johnson? Ever heard of this guy? How old do you think he is? 46 years old. He is, you can take the picture down, but let me tell you about him for a second. Brian Johnson made, I don't know, he's like one of those tech guys who made like a couple hundred million dollars in Palo Alto. And he started Project Blueprint. And what Brian Johnson has been doing for the last handful of years, go look him up. He, it's all public domain. It's all open source. It's all free. He's been spending $2 million a year trying to reverse the aging process. He's trying to get back to a biological age of 18 years old. Why am I talking about this? Because if you'll type to, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul, for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about it this week and we're going to talk about it next week. We're going to talk about the body. Why do you have a body? You probably never asked that question. Why would you? You, just, you have one and everyone else you know has one. Um, Paul, this week, is going to say, Your body is a jar of clay. Sometimes, like we just prayed for, sometimes that jar of clay can't get pregnant. Next week, Paul's going to say, It's a tent. 
And unfortunately, next week we may have to even talk about camping if we're okay, so come back. But Paul's going to talk about the effects of sin and suffering on the body. We're going to look at this for the next two weeks. I want you to see this with me. He says this, but we, verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. This passage is so popular that a a Christian band in the 90s named themselves after it. Anyone here listen to jars of clay? There it is. Oh, yeah. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Okay, we got to talk about treasure. So part of what I want you to know is I want you to know how wealthy you are spiritually right now. There are a lot of places in the Bible where Jesus talks about treasure. And, and by the way, we're kind of, when we're young, maybe even as adults, we love, we're obsessed with treasure, right? It's like, we love the idea of the pirates and is there buried treasure and is there sunken ships and where is their treasure? There's a lot of times in the New Testament where Jesus talks about treasure, but almost every time, in fact, every time that I can find and remember, Jesus talks about treasure in heaven, right? Jesus says, do not store up treasure here. Remember this? This is on the Sermon on the Mount. Where wrath, or where wrath, where moth and rust, not wrath, where moth and rust destroy and where a thief can break in and steal. He says, instead, store up treasure in heaven. So he basically says, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And by faith and good deeds, you can store up treasure. First Peter says, there's treasure reserved for you in heaven, Christian. I love when things are reserved for me. Okay, that doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, you got a reserve seat, a reserve parking spot. That means that's for no one else, and you can cut the line and get right to it. That I know of, this is the only place in the New Testament that talks about the treasure we have right now. What is this treasure? If you drop back to verse six, it's the knowledge of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The treasure isn't money that we have in our bodies. The treasure is a message. What makes the message so valuable? Well, who it's about, it's about Jesus Christ and what he did. What makes the message so valuable is its power in people's lives. It literally changes lives and legacies and destinies. But he said, that we have this treasure. Do you see that where, where it's at? It's in a jar of clay. So God talks, and this isn't insulting. You're made in the image of God and God loves you, but he says, I want you to understand what your body is. He says, it's a jar of clay. He says, but in that jar of clay, there's treasure. So here's what would happen back then. People, and this still happens today, people would hide something very valuable in something that wasn't valuable. I wonder if you've got any hiding places for some of your valuables, right? This is the old, like, right, stuffing money under a mattress kind of idea. Back then, they would say, okay, something's valuable, I'm gonna put it in this jar. Sometimes they would bury the jar in the backyard. These were common jars. So, so here's a way to think about it. We don't use jars or vessels like this as much anymore. This would be like God saying, if you used it today, one translation might be, you're like a, the plastic bag that carries the groceries or your shopping items. Or maybe, maybe the better definition is like, you're like Tupperware, right? Remember, you ever cook some, like, you know, someone has a baby or whatever, or they're sick, and you bring them a meal, and you bring them a meal in Tupperware. Do you ever ask for that Tupperware back? Well, you shouldn't, okay? It's a little strange if you're, <laughs> if you're doing that. Because it's not about the Tupperware. It's about the items that were in the Tupperware. Now, here's what I want us to understand. This is so freeing, that you're a jar of clay. Here's what this means, that you're finite, that you're vulnerable, that you're fragile, that you're limited. See, as a jar of clay, you just realize, okay, we have limited time here. Like, I'm a jar, and and Paul's gonna get here, where I'm gonna break, and I'm gonna be broken, and I'm not gonna be around forever. In fact, I, I try to think about this often here. I try to think at Two Cities Church, just talking about myself for one second, that I am the interim pastor at Two Cities Church. Every pastor is an interim pastor. In 50 years, probably much sooner, somebody else will be here and I'll be dead and gone. As the great theologian Conan (laughs) O'Brien said, he he did say something very deep. He said, um, all graves go unvisited in the final analysis. 
When's the last time somebody visited your great-grandparents' grave? It's been a long time. I don't mean to be too, too dark. It's like, you know, there will be a time, if the Lord tarries, where no one will come and visit your grave anymore. You're a jar of clay. You're here for a limited amount of time. You get about 28,000 days. We have limited energy, right? Especially the older we get, the less energy we have, and Paul's gonna talk about that. We have limited gifts, and then we're just fragile, guys. Right, like one accident can happen. This is what, these jars, by the way, were very easily broken. Right, you've seen this before in your life or someone else's life, one accident on the mountain bike. Like one colonoscopy that you go in and they find something that you didn't think that, it's just like, dude, you, and you will immediately feel your mortality. So what, what, what should we do as jars of clay? Here, there's three things you need to do as a jar of clay. Number one, be empty. It's like, well, what kind of jar would God use? God loves to use an empty jar. The problem with us is we're so full, right? And I'm not, I mean, some of us are full of maybe sinful things, but we're full of just fluff, and all we do is consume. Like, we just consume food, and we consume social media, and we consume streaming services, and we consume YouTube, and we're just not empty. You know, one of the things John, John Tyson was telling me this week is, and I've told you this before, he said, the people that God uses are not just the godly and gifted. That's what we think. Who's the most godly and gifted people? That's who we need. He says, it's godly, gifted, and the power of the Holy Spirit. God uses those who are empty. God uses those who are available. God can't use a jar that's not around, even if it's empty. We were just down, a couple of us, not that long ago, I was down in... Um, Florida at this church that's just growing so quickly. And we were down there to learn from them. We basically said, guys, you know, we're growing, but you're growing even faster. And how do you, how do you find leaders? Because that's what you're always, that's, you know, leaders and money. But, but how, do you, how do you find leaders? Like, you're, how do you launch more and more community groups? And I've been thinking about this for like three months. He said, well, when it comes to a community group leader or a leader in our church, he says, we care a lot less about ability, and what we're looking for is surrender. He said, when we're, when we're looking for a community group leader, yeah, we want them to have good character. We want them to have some social skills and be able to talk to me. But what we care about with a community group leader is high surrender. Because if you're high surrender, you'll, you'll figure out everything else. Be empty, be available. The third one is to be clean. Have, have you ever, have you ever like gone, you know, you're thirsty and you go to your cabinet or whatever, how you ever do this in your kitchen and you grab a cup and you're like, all right, it, you know, it's empty and it's available and you look inside and you're like, did this go in the dishwasher? And you don't want to use something that's not clean. I'll show you this. I think we've got this on the screen. screen. In 2 Timothy 2, let me just read this to you real quick. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul says this, verse 20. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels, that's the same word, jars, of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, no one else can do it for you, from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel, jar, same word, for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You know what? I used to think, and I don't know why I thought this, I used to think that God just picked certain people to work through. I mean, he is sovereign, so in one sense, I'm sure he does that, but he just, he just picks. Okay, let's see, okay, down in Florida, there's this girl named Julie. I'll use her. Okay, up in Boston, there's a guy. I'm gonna use Bob up in you know, Boston. It's like, I, I mean, God's sovereign. I think God uses people who want to be used. I'm not gonna quote John Tyson anymore today, but except for to say this last thing, because he was so impactful, okay? But, you know, he's writing a book in the future that's gonna be coming out. It's all about prayer and revival, and it's called this. God comes where he's wanted. And if you get usable, God will wear you out. But a lot of people don't want to pay the price to be used by God, and the price is character. And the price is repentance. 
Now look what it says here. It says we're a jar of clay, but there's something interesting. Look here. But we have, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So if you ever, you know, which we'll, I think we'll, if we have time, we'll get into this in a little bit. But if you ever get upset that you're just weak, if you get older, you know, you're, you get upset that you're going to die. And probably, you know, we're not as afraid of death as much as sometimes we're afraid of dying and the whole process. And God, here's what I want you to understand. According, this is a very deep verse. Basically, God says, I designed your weaknesses. I designed you, this is what God's saying, I designed you so that I could get the most glory. God designed salvation to humble us, right? Salvation was designed, so the only thing we add to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. Okay, that's humbling. The only thing I bring to my salvation is my sin. But then God made even our Christian service humbling. Because how do you, how do you get the treasure out of the jar? It has to be broken. And God designed the world in such a way that it would be so obvious when God does something through you that it wasn't you. Paul, Paul explains what it's like to be in this jar. Look here, verse eight and nine. We are afflicted in every way. Yikes. Look here, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. What do you notice about all this? It's a reality that he's experiencing followed by, by, by a but not. Four times, you can go back and look at those two verses. Four times he says, but not. There's the appearance of things, and then there's the actual reality of it. I wanna talk about this. He, he talks about the four types of sufferings we experience in this jar. The first is physical suffering, right? He says we are afflicted, but not crushed. And, and this is, if you've been following along in our series, the word afflicted, is it, it was there the first week. This is where Paul uses this at the very beginning of 2 Corinthians 1 to talk about his life. It means pressure. So what he's literally saying is, I'm pressed, but I'm not crushed. Here's what I want to encourage you with if you're a Christian. You can handle more suffering than you think. Here's how life works. The average Christian thinks they can handle more temptation than they can. They can't. And they don't realize they could handle a lot more trials than they currently are. Because you can't think about the future apart from the grace of God. So when the trial is there, God doesn't waste his grace. He doesn't give you the grace before the trial. He gives you the grace in the trial. Paul says we're afflicted. He says, but we're not crushed. The second, he talks about mental suffering. We might say emotional suffering. He says, I'm perplexed, but I'm not driven to despair. What does it mean to be perplexed? The Greek word literally means I'm in a state of confusion. I, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Apostle Paul, who hears directly from God and writes scriptures. Thank you for admitting that even the great Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, guys, there's a lot of times where I'm confused. This is why the longer I pastor, the more I realize it's, it's you just gotta embrace the mystery of life. It's like, man, why did they have a stillborn child? It's like, I'm perplexed, but not driven to despair. Why did she leave this earth so early and leave three kids behind? I am perplexed, but I'm not driven to despair. Paul says, basically, I, I, I'm in a state of confusion and I have more questions than answers. We've talked about that a lot here, but I know the one who has the answers. And look, I don't think God owes us an explanation, but I do think to show off his wisdom and his goodness, I do think in heaven God will explain all these things that we can't understand right now. He says, I'm, I'm visit, here's what it's like to be in a jar. You're crushed. You're afflicted, but not crushed. You're perplexed because you're finite. You know, your brain weighs three pounds. That's what he's saying. I can't think of all this. Look what he says next. He says, he's persecuted, but not forsaken. Okay, the word persecuted here means literally hunted. You, you just think about the Apostle Paul's life. He's like, people are after me. 
you know, he would upset some people and then he'd leave the city and sometimes they'd come after him. They'd follow him to other cities and Paul's like, everywhere I go, people are hunting me. He said, I'm persecuted but not forsaken. He's basically saying, when everybody is against me, God is still with me. One of my most meaningful experiences, deepest experiences of my first year or two here um, at Two Cities was actually something that happened at a different church, but there was this guy and he was like, in his 30s, and I remember he died. It was a heart issue. He died. He was, this was about five years ago. He died in his early 30s. Like, was that Chick-fil-A? Had some chest pain. All the, all the cardiologists, are, cardiologists are confused. He just died, leaving like three kids, the youngest of which was like three months old. And I go, I didn't even know him well, but I went to the, I snuck in the back. I sat in the balcony at this big funeral for him. And I saw his wife with their three kids and she's all dressed in black. And I was completely overwhelmed. And there's all these different speakers that come and I'll never forget this one. He wasn't even a pastor. He was, I don't know why he was speaking. I can't remember his role in the family. He gets up and he, was, he flew there from far away and he said, he said, I came here today, I make this up. He said, I came here today from Idaho. And he looked at the, the, the um, widow in the front row. I came here to tell you God has not forsaken you. And I was like, okay, that's a word. Because when your husband dies and leaves you with three kids, you might think, has God forsaken me? Paul says, I am persecuted, not forsaken. Last one, I'm struck down but not destroyed. That's a wrestling term. He's like, I'm body slammed. Here's what Paul's saying real quickly. I keep getting back up. That's it. All you have to do is get back up as many times as you've been knocked down and you're doing well. The uh, Proverbs says a righteous person falls seven times. Seven in the Bible means like indefinite. Keeps falling, but gets back up. Now look, it gets more interesting. We gotta spend some time on this. Look at verse 11. Always carrying in the body. It's like Paul makes it so hard on us guys. Look at this. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. What does that mean? so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Basically, here's what Paul's saying. I am a pallbearer for the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever been a pallbearer? I've had the honor to do that. You, the pallbearers are close. They were close. They were close to the person who died. Paul says, I carry. I know he's risen, but I carry the death of Jesus Christ with me everywhere as if I was a pallbearer. He's like, what Luther said. Luther said, I feel as though Jesus Christ died yesterday. And then he says more though. He looked three times, he talks about death. For we who live are always, Paul, always? Always be given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And then the, here, here's another, so we get these little summary statements of Paul's ministry. He's like, let me say it in a sentence. Here it is. Here's my ministry in a sentence. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Okay, I don't even know how to talk about this. I mean, you know, different books in the Bible, like I'm like, I, you know, I'm gonna preach, as long as I'm here, I'm gonna preach as much of God's word as I can, and we'll, we're not gonna avoid anything. But at, when I approach a, a different books, I'm like, you know, I don't know if our church is ready for this book. And one of the things that made me not think about doing this book is I'm like, dude, I mean, is our church ready to talk about suffering? Like we just did Habakkuk. Are we ready to talk about this? I mean, for Paul, for Paul, suffering, he says death. Think of, I mean, death is emotional and physical and relational and mental pain is what he's talking about. And he said, guys, he, look at, Paul said, he, if you go back in those three verses or whatever, that two or three verses, he uses the word always twice. Paul's like, for Paul, death was constant. Death was, I mean, continuous. Paul almost died, like, several times. He'll get into that later. And at one point in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I, could you imagine this? He's not, he's not romantic about this. He's not being euphemistic. He's not metaphorical. At one point, Paul writes to the church, he's talking about the resurrection, and he says, I die every day. It's like, well, what do you mean you die? you're still alive? What do you mean you die every day? And I thought, how do I, how do I talk about this in a culture that is obsessed? It means it's so hard to talk about because our culture is obsessed with self-care. 
Could you imagine trying to have a conversation with the Apostle Paul about self-care? It's our laugh. I mean, Paul, you need a nap and a little bit of me time. Paul's like, what is me time? <laughs> you know, I mean, th- uh, these are not wrong, but we live in, this isn't wrong, but we live in the generation of the manicure and the pedicure and the Swedish back massage. I mean, we are designing our lives to pamper ourselves. And then, you probably don't know much about this, but in the church right now, there's, an, there's a movement called the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Movement. I've got a book. Let me show you this book. I'm not against this book. I've read this book. I've recommended this book. Do you see it says, uh, maybe you can see it, it, on the copy that I had, it said a million copies sold. Peter Scazzaro, great guy, I've never met him personally, was leading a large church in New Jersey and he got burnt out. And so he, like, like all the marriage books are written by guys who had horrible marriages and then they fix their marriage, they write the marriage book. And then everyone thinks I need to do the things that the marriage guy said. You can take the picture down. Here's what I wanna just talk about. I, you know, I don't know if this makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, I, you know, I won't do it in the 11 o'clock service. Um, <laughs> um, we, you cannot build your life on emotional, healthy spirituality. Because what you'll start, you'll, you, I've seen this again and again, you will use it. This is, all that, those books are about margin. Those, those books are about your Sabbath. Those books are a lot about, you know, personal reflection. And I will not, if, if, if that is a church planter's favorite book, we will not plant him. Because I've seen, I, I'm just telling you this, this is a little bit insider information behind the scenes. I've seen guys try to plant with this mentality and then they try to get their launch team to get up at six in the morning to set up chairs. And they're like, no, 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 Sabbath. Hold on, no, I, I read the book. I need nine hours of sleep at night. It's like, okay, no, 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 no. You build a church and you build a life on mission. And you remember emotionally spiritual health. And you work six days, but you do take your day off. And we're living in a time where this doesn't make any sense. So, so here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, <laughs> this is so intense. Paul's saying ministry was designed to kill you. Okay, here, let, me, let me bring it down for us. If you've ever been a parent and you've got your you know, one kid or your two kids and I, I don't know what more, it could, it could happen in the first few months, but certainly a couple years in, you're like, parenting is killing me. It's like, that's how it was designed. I'm dead serious. A couple years into marriage. Marriage is killing me. That's how it was designed. Literally. Because you're supposed to suffer and sacrifice and lay your life down for your wife. You're like, what does that feel like? Death, exactly. No offense, ladies. That wasn't supposed to be funny. But women, (laughs) women, I mean, submitting to your husband. Death. <laughs> right? I mean, so I'm just telling you what we try to do, because this is it. You want trips and ticks and techniques so that you don't have to die. It's like, how do I get to disciple my kids without having to die? You don't. How, how do I, how do I get to, how, how do, let's do it. Let's, my neighbor come to Christ without me having to die. Sorry, it's not going to happen. Paul's basically says when you do ministry right, it accelerates and amplifies the death process in your life. You ever see the picture of Abe Lincoln before and after the Civil War? Guys, that's a picture five years apart. Do you see what it did to him? First picture's taken in 1860. Second picture's taken in 1865. He's, he's aged so much walking our nation through the Civil War. One of my favorite pictures of parenting is this one. It's a picture that what a dad does, a mom does too. Across their life is they give themselves to their children. So that at the end, there's less of them and more for their child. You can take the picture down. 
Paul says, guys, this is how it works. So you're gonna have to, and I'm using that term elastically die. You know what I'm talking about when I say that. There's three types of death. There's death to self. That's the hardest. What does Jesus mean? Guys, what does Jesus mean when he says, I mean, do we believe this? Anyone who wants to follow me must deny themselves. Okay, that was, maybe I could interpret that softly. Okay, and take up their cross. What is the cross? An instrument of death. Where do you head with the cross? Do you, go, do you go a lot of places with the cross? You head one place, Golgotha. What can you carry when you're carrying a cross? Nothing. Death to self, here's what it looks like. I submit to God's word and God's will and God's way. That's how you know you're dying to yourself. Not because you didn't eat potato chips when you wanted to. It's, I'm under God's word. I don't have my opinion anymore on things God has said. Or what God has said becomes my opinion. Secondly, death to sin. You ever try living without sin in your life? That's why people keep going back to it. Saying no to heterosexual lust or homosexual lust, do you know what it feels like? Death. Like your flesh is being pulled from your bones is what it will feel like depending on how deep you've been in it. Someone told me one time that an alcoholic, when he doesn't have a drink, I thought this was such a good illustration. So an alcoholic who's like just has an addiction to alcohol, when he, when he feels like he hasn't had a drink in a while and he needs a drink, he said it feels like you're at the bottom of a 30-foot pool. And you're like, I gotta get up for air. And I gotta get up soon for air. So what does it feel like when you keep telling yourself no? It feels like death. How about, final one, death to safety. Uh, guys, I'm not saying be unsafe. I'm not saying, you know, drive 30 miles over the speed limit and don't wear a seatbelt, you know? I'm not saying go buy a motorcycle, don't wear a helmet, and ride right after it rains. We're not saying that. I'm, uh, but here, I think we're desiring adventure, guys. Why do we, why do we go on roller coasters? Because our lives are so boring, <laughs> right? There are no roller coasters in Africa. They're like, there's enough dangerous things out here. We don't need that. There's lions. Right? We jump out of planes. I mean, we just, we are longing for some type of adventure. And when there has to be that, that's why we built in, guys, that the gospel goes forward one relationship at a time and one risk at a time. Paul basically says, I'm willing to die. But look what he says here. We gotta, we gotta move quickly here. He says this. <clears throat> verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith. Okay, that, here's what that means. Outlook on life. Spirit of faith. Attitude. This is my spirit. According to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and we speak. Basically, Paul says, even though I'm suffering, I'm going to speak. Do you know that nothing will silence you like suffering? I know it's silly and goofy that I do this, but I've been cold plunging now for about six months. That means getting in very cold water, usually very early in the morning. I was in 40 degree water at 5.30 this morning. I mean, that's cold. One of my favorite things to do, though, is to introduce new people to cold plunging. Because I love to see a person when that, you, you meet the real person when they get in ice cold water. You're like, there you are, you know? Because, and, and one of the things that I've noticed is when someone gets in ice cold water for the first time, they are silent. Because they are suffering, okay? <laughs> I had this one guy over. He was so kind. He's very godly. He's in our church. He got in cold water, and I said, how you doing, man? He said, shut up. <laughs> I'd never had him speak to me that way my whole life. He was suffering. He wanted to be silent. He wanted me to be silent. Paul says, the temptation is when we are suffering to be silent. And he said, instead, we need to speak. Paul says this, verse 14 knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us, bring us with you into his presence. So uh, we keep talking about this because this is where Paul goes. Paul says, guys, what, why, can I, why am I not afraid of death? Like we need, we need to have a faith that's not afraid of death and dying. He said, I'm not afraid of death because I believe that God's gonna raise me from the dead. I told this story a long time ago, but it was very, it's always been moving to me when I heard it. Um, I, had, I was at a missionary conference years ago and I had a missionary tell a story and he said, there was this couple, imagine this, 
And like, you know, you, you, you go overseas, you're on all these crazy roads. I mean, I've been all over China and India, and it's terrifying. These people, they drive these massive trucks on these little roads. Well, this married couple, they, had, they were second kind of career missionaries. They're on these back roads. I don't remember exactly what happened, but something happened to where their car begins to go off the side of the road, off of a cliff, and the husband's driving, and the wife's door opens up. And she almost falls out of the car, off the cliff. She doesn't, she gets back in barely, she closes the door. They calm down for a second. And this is the powerful part. She looks at her husband and she says, I was ready. I was ready. She didn't know until she said, I was ready. I thought I was gonna die and in the moment, you know what I thought? I was ready. Paul says, I'm not really afraid to die because death is a doorway. And then, this is important though, and if you've ever lost someone, this is really powerful. Hey, look what he says here, I want you to see this. He says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, look, and bring us with you into his presence. In other words, Paul's like, and I'm not afraid of missing you because I'm gonna see you soon. If you've ever had somebody who's dying of cancer and they have, they have little kids, here's what they think. They won't. They don't think I won't if they're dying, they think they won't. My kids won't, my husband won't, my wife won't. Paul says, listen guys, we're gonna be together a lot quicker than you think. So I'm not afraid. I, he, he spent the whole chapter saying, I love you guys. He says, don't worry, if I go ahead of you, you'll be meeting me very quick and the Lord Jesus is gonna reunite us in the resurrection. That's our hope. And then Paul says this, for it is all for your sake, so that grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul's like, I'm doing this for you. Verse 16, look, here it is. Remember, I told you last week, he starts and ends with, we do not lose heart. So we do not lose heart. <laughs> Why, Paul? Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. He's talking about getting older and suffering. And what he's saying is that, that you have an outer self, you know this, and an inner self, and this is just an interesting thing to think about, that across your life, your body and your soul go in opposite directions. If you're, if you're living a vibrant Christian life, that's what's going to happen. And this is why, by the way, you'll, you'll meet somebody in their 80s, and they are still vibrant, though their body is falling apart, because their soul has been just so alive and it's been so strengthened. And Paul says, though outwardly we are perishing, Inwardly, we are being renewed. It's day by day. This is, well, Pastor Nate talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's the incremental nature of our spiritual growth. But I want you to see this. This is important. He says this, for this light momentary affliction. It's like, Paul, really? Paul could say that about his own affliction? This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So there are different passages in the Bible tell us different things about why we suffer. And I, I won't give you a whole, the, I've done it before, a whole theology, purpose of suffering. Basically, one of the things he says here, he says, it's very, every word matters. This light momentary affliction. It's amazing that Paul can say that, right? I've always said minor surgery is surgery somebody else is having, okay, right? <laughs> There's no minor surgery if you're having it. But Paul's able to look at his own suffering and say, in light of what's to come, it's light and momentary. But then he says, it's preparing for us glory. Here's what, here's what I believe this means. God will honor every person's suffering in heaven. I really believe this. Do you, you, do you think that I'm gonna get the same honor of some missionary family that moved their entire life with all of their kids to learn a language? It's like, no way, they're getting way, and I'm fine with it. They're getting way more honored. I don't know how it works up there. I don't know if we get to see it on a video screen. It's like, I wanna talk about them right now, God says. And I wanna know that everything, you know how hard it was for your kids? They, they didn't have any friends for a decade. You, you said goodbye to your grandparents. We're gonna honor this. Think about some mom who has a child with special needs. It's like, do you think that she's getting treated like every other mother? No way. 
God's going to say, I saw it. I know what it cost. I know how you came alongside your son and your daughter. I know how hard it was. You had to deal with him or her being misunderstood in all these years, and I see it, and I'm going to reward it. You know Joni Erickson Tata? She's been in a wheelchair for 50 years. And again, I don't know how it works, but God's going to honor it. That's the purpose. Paul ends with this. Verse 18. As we, here it is. Paul says, you gotta, you gotta keep an eternal perspective. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. He basically says, guys, if we're gonna live this way, if we're gonna suffer for other people, if we're gonna sacrifice, if we're gonna serve, he basically says, you need a larger time frame. You need a larger time frame. Years ago, I went to this leadership development thing, and the guy was helping us plan and visioneer our lives, and he said, guys, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna plan out three years. Where do you wanna be in three years? And he said, let me tell you why three years. He says, because no one thinks three years. He says, everyone thinks, you know, over the next year. And if they're really, if they're going on a big vacation, they're gonna go 18 months. He said, but I want you to think three years. I wanna, I wanna give you a time frame that's gonna mess with you. That's what Jesus is doing through the Apostle Paul. I wanna give you a time frame that's gonna mess with you. It's eternity. And basically, by the way, that's what it means to be mature. Like, there's a lot of different things about how do you become mature. One of the main things, like when you see your son or your daughter become mature, it's when they stop thinking just about now and they start thinking about later. And what Paul says is we can't just think about now, we have to think about later. He says, in fact, he says, he says it really strongly in verse 18. He says, we don't look to the things that are seen. He says, we look to the things that are unseen. In some ways, and I don't understand this, in some ways the unseen is more real than the seen. How's that possible? Can that be possible? It's like, how can something I don't see be more real than what I see? Well, what, everything that we see is going to pass away, the apostle John says. But what is unseen is eternal, so it will always be here. Guys, what would it look like if we actually lived like the Apostle Paul, let me summarize Paul's message today. A ministry that costs you nothing accomplishes nothing. And the Apostle Paul says, if you wanna make a difference, you're gonna have to die to yourself. And so what I wanna encourage you as we're closing is I want you to think about where would I like to see life? It's like, okay, I wanna see life in my marriage. Oh, I wanna see life in my family. I wanna see life in my kids. I wanna see life in my neighbors. Great, now you know the domain in which you're going to have to die. And if you'll bow your heads and if you'll close your eyes, I just wanna give us a chance, just in your heart, and I'm not gonna ask anyone to raise their hands, I'm just gonna ask you to respond. I'm gonna ask you to just pray the prayer, Lord, would you make me a vessel that is empty? And maybe it's up to you, maybe you wanna just put your palms up like this and just, Lord, I receive, I wanna, I wanna be empty. Lord, cleanse me of, of whatever needs to be cleansed. Lord, I wanna be available. Lord, I know you care more about my availability than my ability. Lord, I wanna be clean. If there's an area of your life where you know, you know what, this is it. I need to draw the line in the sand. I need to repent. I pray you do that. Lord, I pray over the men and the women in this room that you would make us like the Apostle Paul. He was so willing to sacrifice. And when you sacrifice, what you basically say is, I'm gonna give up something I love for something I love even more. Lord, would you give us a love for our wives, for our husbands, for our children that would make us willing to sacrifice? Lord, would we say with the Apostle Paul, we're afflicted but not crushed. We're perplexed but not driven to despair. We're persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but we're not destroyed, Lord. Lord, the, the idea of death working in us so life can work in others, that's the principle of the gospel. Because Jesus, you died we now can have life. Would we live out that pattern of the gospel here at Two Cities Church? In Jesus' name, amen.